Hi everyone, um, my name is Taylor and welcome to our 88th virtual shadowing session. Tonight we have for you Innovation in Medicine with Dr. Jarrett. Next slide, please. As always, this is our working group comprised of our four physicians, Dr. Fowler, Dr. Marchetti, Dr. Salazar, and Dr. Reno. Next slide. Um, just to let you guys know, our upcoming sessions next week, we're gonna have thoughts on the application cycle with Dr. Fowler. Um, and Dr. Nigan. And then the 22nd is still up in the air, it's to be decided. And then on the on March 1st, we have a specialty spotlight in emergency medicine, then on, on the 8th, internal medicine. Next slide, please. Um, as always, I just wanted to remind everyone to put their questions in the chat as we go so we can get your questions answered. Um, and so, yeah, uh, without further ado, Dr. Fowler, do you have anything you'd like to say? Yeah, welcome. Good evening, everybody. For this, our 88th session, we would never have believed almost two years ago that we would be going this long, but you keep coming back, so we're here. And if you keep coming back, we will keep being here. Um, there's been enormous participation all over the world. We've had, as of right before the session this evening, we've had 61,400 of you sign up from around the world. And we've had 511,000 viewings of the programs we posted online. So clearly there's a need. And um, as you're going to hear more next week from um, myself and Dr. Wynn uh, as members of the admissions committee here at UT Southwestern, we're going to be talking about some thoughts about now at just having completed an admissions committee season with so many of all of y'all, for us, it was about 6,000 applicants, you know, from all over. What are some of the thoughts that we see about successful candidates and less successful candidates, specifically about medical school? But we will also expand that to NP and PA as well. In any case, we want you to know on the behalf of the working group, how very much we appreciate this weekly participation. We know it's a couple of hours out of your life. We hope that the candidate, no, the speakers, I'm sorry, that we uh, bring on, like the wonderful Dr. Bloomquist from last week, if you didn't see his talk, you must watch it. And then that marvelous talk from the week before, uh, Shanine, who spoke about uh, how to tell a patient that they're dying. I mean, wonderful programs. And tonight is no exception. Philip Jarrett is a really good friend of mine. Uh, he is a resident with us in emergency medicine at UT Southwestern with whom I have worked how many hours, Philip? Hundreds so far. Many um, hundreds. And I've also introduced him to the bar at UT Southwestern. <laughs> the faculty club turns into a bar at two o'clock. It's very civilized. Uh, what's the name of the bartender, Philip? Oh, you're speaking of Melvin. Of course. And uh, We're in, a in any case, uh, it down. Philip is one of the best and finest, one of the really great minds. We were, trying, we were recruiting him to stay on with us uh, for a fellowship. And uh, Taylor, why don't you uh, make some final intros of our guest, and then Philip, you can take it away. Yeah, um, I just want to say please give a warm welcome to our guest and um, just respect his, his time, and that's it. Please enjoy the show. Great. Thank you so much, guys. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, I'm Philip Jarrett. I'm one of the emergency medicine residents at Parkland Hospital in UT Southwestern here in Dallas, Texas. I must have cast the wool over Dr. Fowler's eyes. I'm not really sure what I did to earn this. I don't think that it's that common for residents to take the lead on one of these discussions, but it may have something to do with my somewhat non-traditional career path and the work that I do and my research outside of the emergency department that might add some value. My overarching goal on this talk is to kind of inspire you guys to take a couple of lessons from my experience so that you can find ways to innovate as you go into your careers in healthcare. At any given point, whether you're working with patients in clinics, in the hospitals, in the operating room, there are gonna be opportunities for you to make a difference by modifying the way we approach treatments and surgeries and discussions with families and how we engage with patients, whether it's virtually or in person. And all of those are opportunities to innovate. And it is my opinion that we have an obligation as healthcare providers to innovate. So let's talk a little bit about me first. So I was born in Jacksonville, Florida. Um, there's a picture here that kind of shows my hometown. I'll admit that a couple of, of the buildings on this picture were not built yet when I was born, uh, but it has continued to grow since that time. Uh, it is notorious for a couple of things. And I say notorious in a bad way because we are the home of the Jacksonville Jaguars. And though I tried to be a fan, it's very difficult to be a fan. 
Uh, instead, I decided to come to Texas as soon as I could. Of course, I was only about seven years old and cheer for a team that kept my butt on the end of the seat, and that would be Texas Tech. Uh, while Texas Tech doesn't win often, they win often enough for me to think we might stand a chance. Every year they prove me wrong, uh, but every year I have a little hope left. And after undergrad, I went on to grad school at Texas Tech and did a master's in business administration before coming to UT Southwestern for medical school. Now, this place is so cool. It has all the best resources for medical students, for training, for research, for clinical experience. And so I just couldn't bring myself to leave. So ultimately, I decided to stay here and go into emergency medicine at Parkland Hospital. Here's a picture of it at back in 2014 when it was. So let me see. You went, you went to med school at UT Southwestern, which means I voted on you. Did you make us proud? You let me know. <laughs> <laughs> let me know at the end of this talk. We'll, we'll see. Uh, uh. Yes, yes. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what I wanted to discuss with you guys today. And while we're not going to be talking directly about the experience of patient care in the room, uh, I like to do a little bit outside of the room for my patients as well. And so that's sort of the focus of the talk today. Um, I wanna define the scope of physicians in regard to who we should be innovating for, how we identify opportunities to innovate and sort of the pathways to innovate. Uh, and part, like, uh, part and parcel to that discussion is that if you're gonna do this, you need to understand quite a bit about intellectual property so that you know where you're starting, what material to work with, how the law defines it. And it kind of gives you an idea of when you're approaching an opportunity to innovate, how to develop solutions that are protectable, that are marketable, and that are going to uh, uh, work well for patients and the providers that use those technologies. And then throughout, we'll, dis we'll discuss a couple of cases of things I've worked on in the past. They're kind of uh, sprinkled in. Uh, so, the physician scope in healthcare in general was defined long ago and you all, you all know it. And so we can uh, read off the Hippocratic Oath here together all at once, ready? One, two, three, I'm just kidding. Uh, here it is in its original uh, text, of course, translated, uh, but it's been changed over time because a lot of people found that it was quite narrow and kind of funneled physicians into particular uh, obligations that not all physicians were uh, content on assuming. And I think this, uh, this uh, Hippocratic Oath spans far beyond the role of the physician, but also all other kind of ancillary healthcare providers. Uh, but we have certainly narrowed it down a little bit. Now the extremists will say, first do no harm and they stop there. Uh, I also like to do some good. And so I like to include uh, a little bit more into my sort of my own practice of the Hippocratic Oath, which is to practice two things in your dealings with disease, either help, or do no harm. Now, I will admit this is a big job. And uh, providers in healthcare, uh, I know many who are dedicated just to getting really good at their craft, to mastering the ability to provide excellent patient care. And they spend their entire career studying the research and reviewing literary articles and reading the textbooks and even writing the textbooks to try to enhance our healthcare system and try to maximize the quality of care that they provide. But I'm gonna make an argument that physician innovators in particular suffer from another condition. Not only that we wanna master what we know, uh, but we wanna to continue to discover things that we don't yet know and try to modify our approach to medicine that we can, so that we can continue to grow and improve. And so the honest truth is that physician innovators suffer from something called ennui. And I would challenge you guys, if anybody, if you think you know the meaning of this word, to write it in the chat because it is a rare word, but it is the perfect term to describe the situation for physician innovators. So ennui, it means a dissatisfaction with the status quo. And physician innovators suffer from this constantly. Every time we see patients, every time we're dealing with a procedure or working with families, trying to have discussions about goals of care, uh, I think we're all suffering from this concern that we just wanna do more and we wanna do better and we wanna find ways to make healthcare more enriching for our patients, for maybe even easier for us to perform, less costly for our patients. And so although we're working toward mastery of all these things that we know, the reality is that we also crave the unknown. And so we're con continuing to kind of search for that. And so the burden of physician innovators then is to improve healthcare. And that's quite simple. 
Uh, but it is a burden and we deal with it every day because healthcare is imperfect and life is imperfect. And so we're constantly encountering situations where we could do better. And um, I would challenge everybody in the room just to kind of think of ways that you can improve healthcare because that is such a broad term. Uh, but there are some specific ways that are particularly um, uh, conducive to innovation in the form of medical devices and pharma pharmaceutical developments and modifications of procedures so that we can make a difference for patients. And so I've just kind of hashed out some here. Uh, new procedures is a big one. It's sort of a cutting edge thing. Every time you develop a new procedure, you're disrupting the market, so to speak. You're going to have to reteach all of the providers that perform that procedure how to do the new one. And so there's a lot of barrier to entering the market when you're approaching innovation from that perspective. Now, efficacy of treatment uh, can be approached in many ways. We can modify the doses of our treatments, the frequency of our treatments. Uh, we can uh, cut the doses in half or we combine known treatments together to see if we can create a combinatorial effect or a synergistic effect with those medications. Uh, we like to make our procedures faster if we can by using different types of technology like ultrasound that helps us guide our procedures or fluoroscopy that's used in the operating room for invasive vascular procedures. Now, new treatments is arguably the one that takes the most work. You have to essentially invent from ground zero. You have to come up with a new approach. You have to find a new drug out of nowhere. And it takes a lot of effort and a lot of, uh, a lot of funding and a lot of administrative and sort of regulatory approval to kind of get through the process of introducing that innovation. But those are the ones that I would argue have the most potential to do good. Now we can just kind of run through these others here. So cost of treatment is a big one. And the United States, we have the most expensive healthcare in the world. One of the physicians I work with says that if you want the best health care, you got to pay for it. And that's the U.S. But I don't buy into that philosophy entirely. I think there's some improvements we can make to our healthcare system and our approaches to procedures and medications and devices that will decrease the cost of those treatments over, over time. And then access is a big one. Fortunately, in the U.S., we have tons of resources, and yet even still, we have large populations of people that don't have consistent and reliable access to medications and procedures. And there's a significant difference. If you look at the top 10th percentile of the population and the bottom 10th percentile, what sort of quality of treatment they receive. Uh, let's go ahead and jump on to the next slide. Philip, can I blurt something in? You oh, know, yeah, sure. innovation, though, is not necessarily only <clears throat> invention. It is looking around and seeing how things are being done and, and proposing change. For example, the story is that of Ignaz Semmelweis, who was an ob -Gin doc in the 1840s in Vienna, Austria. And at that time, there were the hospitals where women in labor would come in about to have their baby. <clears throat> and the death rate for women in labor was approaching like 15% or more from septic endometritis, also known as childbed fever, also known as puerperal sepsis. <clears throat> and Semmelweis noticed that the, in the smaller, and, and in that hospital, the doctors who were unfortunate enough to lose a patient would take the patients to the pathology lab and dissect them, the, the dead people, to find out why they died. And this was long before any hand washing. It was unknown. They would wipe their hands on their coats. They would have these thick streams of goo on their white coats. And clearly the most uh, intelligent and experienced for the physicians were the ones with the thickest stripes of goo on their coats. <laughs> Some of us saw this, and he also saw that in the other hospital that didn't have a pathology lab that was run by nuns who were very fastidious, the death rate was only about 2%. This was at least 40 years before Koch's germ theory of disease. Nobody knew why it was happening. You know, were you in a bad mood? Was it evil humor? Did the patients not pray enough? You know, and so forth. So Semmelweis simply did one thing. He had all of his staff, he was this bald, arrogant, unpleasant fellow, but for his ward, he had his staff wash their hands in chlorate of lime, which is calcium hypochlorite. Today we use sodium hypochlorite, which is bleach. He had his staff bleach their hands and their instruments and the death rate before touching a patient and the death rate plummeted to zero. And he published this. 
and no one believed him because there was no explanation for it. Ultimately, he was not rehired. He went back home to Budapest where he lost his mind, was beaten by guards in an insane asylum and died. And yet we now know today that, you know, Godzilla back there bugs live in hospitals and that uh, good um, hygiene is absolutely critical. And that was an innovation that was life-saving. And to this day, we owe that to a forgotten fellow back, you know, 170 years ago. What a heartwarming story. Yeah, true story. Wow, what an unfortunate end. Uh, you are absolutely right. And in fact, we'll discuss a little bit later that there are pathways even to protect things that aren't devices. There are, there are pathways to describe and protect and incentivize people to adopt processes, which are not necessarily tangible devices or approaches to procedures, just modified ways to perform a procedure in a way that doesn't modify the actual sort of equipment used. Um, but this kind of brings me into my next point here, which is, you know, if what we create is valuable and it adds uh, something to the quality of patient care, how do we protect it? And I think even a more uh, salient question is, should we? You know, we're in the business of providing healthcare. Uh, I would say people in healthcare are generally well compensated. And so it seems like there wouldn't be much motivation to try to get up like a patent, for instance, to protect your invention because you're just doing it for the greater good of the population. Uh, I will admit though, that I'm going to try to make a case today about why the patent system exists and why it is helpful, particularly in a free economy in the US uh, to incentivize hospitals and providers and healthcare systems to adopt these technologies. Uh, so when we think of property normally, uh, we usually think of things that are tangible, things like our cars and our houses and our shoes. And while these things certainly are property uh, and are, it's kind of evident how we would like to defend them by wearing them and protecting them and calling the police if someone tries to take them, uh, the things about uh, intellectual property are that it's not so obvious what it is for people who haven't dealt with it in the past. And so what is intellectual property exactly? Well, it's, it's actual creations of the mind and you can protect creations of the mind that aren't even physical yet. Things that haven't manifested in the world. And uh, we'll, we'll go into a little bit more about why we would want to protect it and what kind of incentivizes us to do so. Uh, but I wanted to talk a little bit about examples of intellectual property. And this goes into your point, Dr. Fowler, that not all things that are protectable are tangible devices. Uh, things as simple as song lyrics can be protected. Things like artwork and slogans and logos are protectable. Chemical compositions of matter are protectable. So if you create a new type of drug candidate, a lead molecule, so to speak, those are protectable. Trade secrets are protectable in certain ways. There is precedence in the courts about how to protect trade secrets. Uh, device, obviously device designs are protectable. And these are protectable even before you have built the thing. As long as you can describe it in, on paper, you can potentially protect it. Another one that is pretty um, uh, up for debate currently at the uh, US Supreme Court is software. And the way that software can be protected even through the patent system is under debate because much of software is about kind of repositioning and combining things that people have done in the, in the past to make a new feature develop. And we can talk a little bit about the components of patents that sort of uh, brings up why that is so hotly debated. And throughout this, I just want to keep reminding you guys why we discuss this. So in order to kind of perform innovation for the best benefit of patients, uh, protection is actually going to be important. And so it's helpful to have an idea about how to approach it and what the important factors of, of uh, inventions uh, for the sake of protecting and ensuring that you can protect them and incentivize the market to adopt them uh, will actually be important. And so we do have methods to protect these solutions. And uh, the question remains why? So our world is imperfect. And unfortunately, the greed that results from this, this world incentivizes secrecy. And as a result, you know, if you develop a solution uh, for a new shampoo that changes your hair color every week so that you can stay lit, uh, 
it's going to be uh, a popular product. And if the, the chemical composition of that product is so difficult to reverse engineer that you can keep it private, you may own that market forever. And so secrecy in some degrees uh, kind of limits societal growth because other people can't figure out how to do it and kind of build upon it. It also empowers monopolies uh, to continue to use that technology and amass great wealth when other people are eager to kind of get a piece of the pie. And so uh, fortunately the government has struck a deal with the population of citizens. And this goes way back. Uh, in April 10th of 1790, the US Congress passed the first patent act. It was entitled an act to promote the progress of useful arts. And what they proposed is that, you know, we want people to innovate. We want people to develop new technologies, but we also want to be able to progress beyond that invention when someone else has a new idea and wants to build upon it. So here's what we will do. And this is the government speaking, of course. They say, here's what we'll do. Describe exactly for us, ex exactly word for word, how your technology works such that someone else could copy it and kind of uh, rebuild that technology and take ownership of it, build it, manufacture it, distribute it themselves. We want you to tell us exactly uh, what's in the secret sauce, but in exchange, we'll give you exclusive rights so that only you can produce it, only you can distribute it, and only you can make money off of it for a period of time. And this was designed so that uh, individuals and corporations had a way to protect their devices and their processes and their software and other solutions, uh, but would be able to still kind of contribute to the, the greater good of society and kind of create a, uh, a track record of the progress in society when it comes to innovation. And so just to define these a little bit for us for uh, exclusive rights, these are uh, the rights offered by the, the government to people who apply for protection and it excludes others from making, selling, or using an invention for a limited period of time. And the, depending on which type of protection you apply for, you get a different period of time that is allotted for you to protect that. And then secondly, we've got an enabling disclosure. And what this really means is that it is a publication that is of sufficient detail to allow a person of skill in the art, essentially someone who does your type of job, uh, when they read it, they would be able to carry out the invention as well. So I want to jump aside for a little moment because I feel like we can really get in the weeds with the legal stuff and kind of lose track of the medicine. And so let's talk about a case here. So a 64-year-old woman comes into her family physician's clinic and she's accompanied by her daughter due to concerns about progressive memory loss that's been going on for the past few months. She's been misplacing her keys. She's been wandering off on walks without her family and getting lost. And her neighbors kind of have to redirect her to remind her how to get home. And she also occasionally forgets the names of relatives. And uh, it's kind of getting worse. She's forgetting the names of people she knows better and better. Now, the primary care physician has a, a broad consideration of all the possible causes of her memory loss. And so they perform significant testing and they perform some neuropsychiatric evaluation to establish a baseline for her mental health and function. And it results in the diagnosis of Alzheimer's disease, which is really quite an awful condition and we'll discuss it in detail. Uh, the patient is ultimately started on Dinepazil. It's a common medication used for Alzheimer's disease and it's an, anti, an acetylcholinesterase inhibitor. And um, they also provided the patient with some resources for part-time sort of home health nursing assistance for her declining activities of daily living or ADLs, which is something we use in medicine to kind of help us understand whether patients are able to take care of themselves. Are they able to brush their teeth? Are, are they able to pay their bills? Are they able to feed themselves and use the restroom? These are things that as they start to fall off, their healthcare expenses start to go up the suffering of their family who is burdened with taking care of them goes up. And this is one of the points in, in a person's lifespan when the healthcare expenses really starts to skyrocket and is a point um, in time where innovation and uh, solutions to try to help people retain their mental health and their ability to get along in life uh, can make a really long lasting impact both for family and for the healthcare system as a whole. So let's talk a little bit about 
Alzheimer's and the sort of underlying physiology of the disease. So we've got a brain here and the brain is obviously made of billions of nerves and these billions and billions of nerves uh, communicate down through the spinal cord and communicate every thought, every uh, bit of information and sensory finding and every motor movement of your muscles throughout your body. And these nerves each on their own play an important role and they engage with each other through small connections known as synapses. And these nerves have a really tough job to do because while the nerve cell can start way up in the cortex of the brain, there are some nerves that have to travel all the way down to the end of the spinal cord near your butt essentially before connecting with the next neuron to send off signals to your leg, for instance. And so cells are tiny as everybody knows. They're microscopic, you have to use a microscope to see them. And yet they have to somehow organize some really complex architectural performance within the cell to make sure that all parts of the cell are healthy and functioning well, even though the nucleus might be seemingly light years away from the other end of the cell. And so uh, we've got a picture of a mitochondria up here and the mitochondria really drive the pathophysiology of Alzheimer's disease. And the reality is that these mitochondria are very small. And uh, in one sense, Alzheimer's disease is the slow kind of cumulative dysregulation of these mitochondria throughout the nerves, throughout the neurons, and uh, the slow accumulation of the cell's inability to regulate the movement of these mitochondria. So the mitochondria need to be way down in the dendrites, way in those feet that are out touching the next neuron, and that could be seemingly miles away. And as these mitochondria start to misbehave, some unfortunate things will happen. They start to produce uh, excess proteins that normally have a, a healthy function in the cell, but can start to accumulate in abnormal ways. This one right here is called amyloid beta. It is uh, normally used for neuronal growth and nerve cell development, but when it runs rampant, it actually starts to form these things called uh, amyloid plaques or amyloid beta plaques. And so this is a kind of a cool picture where we see some neurons with the dendrites coming out, but we've also got these big balls here that are accumulating and they're just millions, billions of copies of amyloid beta that are starting to accumulate because they have no place to go and they're unregulated and the cell has kind of lost its ability to keep, keep this protein in, uh, like in tabs, so to speak. And as a result, amyloid beta, along with a couple of other players in the disease, including tau proteins, start to cause dysregulation of some of the normal function of nerves. And so there's a protein that lives on the, the membrane of mitochondria. It's called dynamin related protein one. And its job is to cut mitochondria in half. Uh, as cells grow, they need to make more mitochondria and they need to distribute them throughout the cell so that the cell is able to produce energy in the places it needs it most right when it needs it. And DRP1 helps do that. It helps divide these mitochondria so that they can perform their job. Unfortunately, as people start to age or develop Alzheimer's dementia, the DRP1 protein becomes a little dysregulated. In fact, the research shows us that as amyloid beta starts to accumulate in the body, amyloid beta actually incentivizes DRP1 to split mitochondria more often and in irregular ways. This results in more damaged mitochondria that are being produced and that damaged mitochondria get marked for cell death or essentially mitophagy, which is when the cell kind of chews up that mitochondria to get rid of it. But as a result, it produces all of these extra things in the cell that actually incentivizes the cell itself to die with time, including the secretion of calcium from the, the inner membrane of the mitochondria and ultimately leads to uh, degeneration of the brain and of the mind. However, when I was at Texas Tech, I was uh, performing my master's in business when I was offered a job to work at the patent office there. It was just a side gig so that I can make some money while I was studying. Uh, but I was essentially assigned the job of assessing other people's ideas for patent eligibility and market value. And this came across my desk. There was a researcher at the university who worked in the neuro neurology kind of basic research department and had uh, been evaluating a few different molecules that were known to regulate DRP1. But this one he managed to develop himself and caught a lot of interest. 
Now it's called DDQ because the name itself, if, if written out is about a thousand letters long, uh, impossible to pronounce. But what he found is that this molecule actually inhibits amyloid beta's activity as it sort of activates or incentivizes DRP1 to perform mitochondrial fission. And he became very interested in the prospect that this might slow down Alzheimer's disease altogether. And so that brings us to one of my first ventures uh, before medical school, which is a company that we called Synaptex Pharmaceuticals. Essentially that researcher wanted to apply for some grant funds that were only available to companies not to academic researchers and academic institutions. He wanted some money that was specifically designed for commercialization, which is the early stage of research focused on how to make large quantities of a medication so that it can be tested or how to make, uh, how to develop mass production techniques so that these things can be uh, developed in large quantity for human trials. And so when it came across my desk and he was interested in this funding, I offered to help him start a company and lo and behold, he said yes. And so that day I became the co-founder of Synaptex Pharmaceuticals, which is a company that is trying to offer solutions for age-related disease, chief among them being Alzheimer's. And so here's the team of doctors uh, that I work with. Himachandra Reddy was that, was that uh, research faculty who discovered DDQ. He works closely with Sudhir, He's a research associate that works at the university as well. And then we, uh, over time, had, as, we, as our research grew, we had to find other research in the, researchers in the building that weren't directly associated with the company so that we could funnel some of our funds to sort of an unbiased academic uh, researcher to kind of help us develop the story for this potential drug or lead molecule. And his name is Morali, and he's kind of run, kind of heading up all of the animal models for us these days. And then there's the two of us here on the end. There's Ryan Reber and myself. We're the folks who are essentially responsible for applying for the funding and making sure that we have our commercialization, commercialization strategies developed. And we speak directly with the NIH about our funding applications. And we do a lot of this sort of... Uh, the middleman work between the researchers and the funding sources to make sure that the research has the funds that it needs to continue progressing. And so a little bit of overview about the company. So we formed in 2016 uh, to develop some lead molecules uh, to combat age-related disease for Alzheimer's, dementia, Huntington's, Parkinson's, uh, but we're focused on Alzheimer's at the moment because that's, the, where, that's where our current product seems to have the most uh, utility. We have one issued patent and two more that are pending for related lead molecules. In case the first one fails, we, for some small minute reason, we've got two others pending as backups. Uh, we have licensed all of the intellectual property that comes from this research lab, and they belong essentially to the company. They've been assigned to the company. And then we've received our first NIH uh, Small Business Innovation and Research Grant of $230,000 back in 2018 and just finished using it up in late 2020. And that's uh, a type of funding called non-dilutive funding. It essentially means that even though they're giving us money, they're not taking a part of the company. And then what we do is that uh, in reality, the business is sort of, uh, is just a little office. And the, the job of the office is, the, is to give the research money back to the people who know how to use it. So we just subcontract all the research back to the university and give them the money that they had requested because that's what this whole thing was about, was to funnel money specifically focus on commercialization research back to the university where it could be good, put to good use. And then we're looking for more, non-dilutive funding as we continue to progress through our research. So let's talk a little bit about the market. So unfortunately, Alzheimer's disease and dementia is the sixth leading cause of death in the United States. Other things that are up there really high are like heart disease and car accidents. This is among them, it's a huge one. Uh, it unfortunately currently is affecting about 5.8 million Americans and it's affecting about 50 million people worldwide. Uh, unfortunately, women are at higher risk than men for it, uh, but we also expect that the number of patients suffering from Alzheimer's disease is gonna triple by 2050 if we don't find a cure to slow this down. Now, one third of Americans over 85 uh, have a diagnosis of Alzheimer's, one third. And that's just, it's just crazy to think about how much good we could do if we could develop a solution to this. And then the annual market size for someone who might develop a solution that actually works is $13.3 billion a year. 
and that's just in the United States. So our solution we already kind of talked about was this DRP1 antagonist. It inhibits uh, DRP1 and it inhibits its interaction with amyloid beta. As a result, it allows mitochondria to live a little bit longer, to get transported where they need to go and prevents the effects of amyloid beta um, in the near term. What we don't know is, you know, how long can you take this medication and stave off its effects? Does it last forever? Or does the amyloid plaque essentially grow uh, with time to the point where we can no longer combat it? That question left is, uh, remains to be seen and that's what part of our research focus is dedicated toward. Now, a lot of the research that's been done has already been published in peer-reviewed journals and some of it's also been patented. Uh, we have a, a patent for the first one, the DDQ molecule. The patent is called Drug Targets of Delayed Aging in Human Brain, Brain Diseases. It, it was filed in November of 2017 and was granted uh, late in 2020. So there's the mitochondria. There's our DDQ right in the middle of DRP1 inhibiting its action. And here is the first patent that was issued to the company. And so you can see the inventors up here at the top. It was Dr. Reddy and Dr. Sakar were the first, uh, the folks who were involved in the initial development and the actual like, chemical uh, synthesis of this uh, lead molecule. And uh, it was the first patent, patent that we've been issued. So I don't think we need to kind of beat the dead horse, so to speak, on this. Um, but suffice to say that the mitochondria is the powerhouse of the cell you know, and uh, we're doing what we can to keep that powerhouse going. I think I have talked us through a lot of this content here. Yeah. And so, you know, patents are one way to protect things and they have a lot of merit for doing so. And in fact, a large portion of the innovations in the United States are uh, comprised or contained within patents. It, it surprises some people when I tell them that there are actually more patents in the world than publications in peer reviewed journals. Uh, it is an effective way to communicate research while also protecting it. And I would say that it's also becoming more and more popular and incentivized by universities for people who are in academia doing research or considering remaining as faculty in whatever field you decide to choose. Uh, because at some places like Stanford, faculty are sort of given these continuing education points each year. And articles, like peer-reviewed articles that they publish are given a point, but patents are given too. So they're considered twice as valuable. So we've got a couple of publications that came out within the last year, both of which are focused essentially on um, the effect of our drug on how well my, mice move through this really challenging maze. And the mice are designed genetically to develop Alzheimer's at about three months of age. They become confused, they develop memory loss, they lose their sort of incentive to eat. And so we develop these mouse models and we feed them the medication and then we track them and see how well they get through the maze and whether they can develop a memory of the maze and kind of track it over the time. And we've got some early data suggesting that um, our drug uh, significantly uh, increases the ability of mice to remember how to get through a maze. It, they continue to eat and they don't lose weight as quickly as the, the control. And uh, we've got lots of in vitro data showing that in vitro nerves uh, have significant improvement in mortality. This is just cells in a Petri dish. So there's a lot of work left to be done to determine how this would affect a real human's lifespan. But nonetheless, uh, we're working toward that and it just takes time. I'll admit when you're developing a new treatment, like we discussed earlier, new treatments are the most challenging to develop because there's so much work to be done. And so we've partnered with a couple of companies. One is called Uberon. They have a lab space near Texas Tech where they allow us to use some of their chemical manufacturing services and help us somewhat mass produce the drug that we need for our testing in mice. And then because of the publications that we've developed so far and the patents that we're starting to accrue, we've gotten some early interest from uh, another pharmaceutical company that's uh, very reputable called Velocity Pharmaceutical Development. And their job is essentially to acquire uh, lead molecules from other companies that are showing promise in, uh, in diseases for which 
there is significant funding, but lots of failure. And that is sort of the quintessential description of the market for Alzheimer's disease. So the next step for this company is really that we're just targeting more funding to get us through the next stages. And we're looking to sell. As soon as we can sell, we want to get this lead molecule to a company that has tons of resources and the ability to achieve higher throughput and, uh, and kind of get this to market as fast as possible. So let's switch gears back a little bit to some of that theoretical stuff about- Well, a couple of things, Philip. That, yeah. God, what a great talk. And I, I'm glad you went through the physiology. All the students here are going to be dealing with this in some portion with biochem, physiology, and so forth coming down the road away. So thanks for presenting that. It's also beginning to understand that the healthcare provider of the future is going to have to be prepared for these things to be able to try to understand what in the world, you know, that you're actually doing. Preserving mitochondria is essential. It turns out that melatonin preserves mitochondria and so forth. I mean, so um, it was also interesting that you worked in a patent shop and then you got an idea because that is exactly what Einstein did. You know, he was sort of unhirable in his 20s, Albert Einstein, uh, in the early 1900s. And then, uh, and he just started looking at all these, um, all these devices and patents going through and it gave him time to think. And then of course, he released his, uh, he had his Anus Mirabilis, his amazing year in 1903 to 1905, when he put out and discovered the, um, theory of relativity e equal mc squared so I, I knew you were a genius there jared <laughs> give it time i'm still waiting for the e equals mc squared for my own yeah wait, well you were you were supposed to say everything is relative but that's okay <laughs> all right i'll get there i'll get there all right so this is the slide that we left off at before we started the case talking about enabling disclosures and kind of defining some of the important terms for intellectual property but I think we need to talk about why, because I still struggle with this myself, having been working uh, with patents for the past six or seven years and toiling over the concept that we're supposed to be doing this for the public good and that I'm going to be paid well enough to live a comfortable life. Do I really need to kind of pursue protection so that I can suck every dollar out of these ideas? Uh, but I think there's more to it than that. And the reality is that healthcare is really expensive. It really is. And so let's look at how much money is spent to kind of support innovation in healthcare. And maybe we can make a case for protecting technology as you develop it. So who pays for progress? Well, the reality is that we do. Uh, we pay with our tax dollars and our tuition revenues to the universities that are doing the research. The NIH is the biggest funder of research in the United States. The CDC also funds a significant uh, portion of the work in infectious disease. The FDA actually has a portion of funds not only dedicated to regulation, but also to research. And then uh, BARDA, or the Biomedical Advanced Research and uh, Development Authority, also has a significant fund for sort of device work as well. Now, this is largely driven by tax dollars and tuition revenues, these things that go to the universities and to the government institutions that fund this stuff. But these groups specifically are focused on very early stage research. They help the people who don't have any interest from corporations and aren't going to get big uh, paydays with uh, buyouts and acquisitions because the companies need something that has promise. And so that is the job of the government is to incentivize people to innovate from the very start. And so the biggest contributor to that early stage research is actually the government. Now, when it comes to the later stages, the actual sort of validation of whether a drug or a device or a procedure or a process actually works well and would fit into the market, it generally comes down to the corporations. For drugs in particular, it's corporate pharmaceutical companies. And these companies make all their money a different way. They make it from their corporate revenues, from selling the products that are already available in their product lines. And then they also get funding, especially sort of like the mid-range and the small pharmaceutical companies, the very small like mine, uh, from venture capital companies. And these kind of drive the funding for those sources. Now, the biggest one overall may surprise you because like there's so much tax money going to the government and we would assume that that contributes to the largest 
uh, a source of research funding that there is, but let's just kind of look at that for a second. So what do you guys think is the average cost to bring a new drug to the market in the United States? Just a new drug, let's say my drug, the DDQ medication. Just throw out some ideas. I'm curious about your guesses because it's a decent amount of money. I certainly don't have it in my savings. I would be impressed if you do. It is a lot of money. It is approximately $1.3 billion for one drug. Now it is highly variable depending on the market, depending on which disease process you're trying to treat, how well funded that industry is and what drugs have come before you because the complexity of an FDA approval process and human trials, it's largely dependent on how similar your drug is to others. But this is an average. It goes to upwards of 50 billion in some extreme cases and as low as uh, like 250 to 300 million. But who's really paying for it? So what do you think the average annual research and development expense of pharmaceutical companies is? How much money, let's say, yeah, let's say how much money do, do pharmaceutical companies have to spend annually on their research? You know, we're, we'll see in a moment how much the FDA and the NIH and others have as well. Um, in reality, it's a lot of money. It's $83 billion per year that is being spent by pharmaceutical corporations to develop new drugs and new devices uh, to enhance healthcare. So let's compare that to the people that we know are making a difference in those early stages of research. So the NIH being the biggest among them, how much money do you think the NIH had in its budget in 2018? I think it's 83 billion. Is it even close? No, it's not even close. It's $26.9 billion. So in reality, the corporations are making just as large, if not significantly larger comp contribution to healthcare progress as the government is. And they're doing it from corporate revenues and uh, they are actually contributing the largest source of funding. Now, do these companies get buyout in emergencies and things like that? Yes, they certainly do. But when the economy is healthy, they are the largest contributor of research overall. Now, those, the, the government is the largest contributor in that early stage of research, but it turns out once, you, once a corporation buys out that drug or that device and takes it to the later stages of development, that's where it gets expensive. Once you start designing human trials and bringing in uh, hospitals and uh, hospital administration and doing IRB trials and studies and things like that, it gets very expensive. Developing mass production techniques, that's where the money is. So why in the world would a company do this? You know, this is a very expensive prog. Uh, process. It takes a lot of resources to develop new innovative solutions for healthcare. The only reason they can justify it is intellectual property. They have to be able to protect these solutions if they're going to make their money back so that they can continue to innovate and help progress healthcare toward the next stage. And so the government has made this, pro this, this proposal to pharmaceutical companies. And I will tell you the law for patent law is not designed for pharmaceutical companies. Pharmaceutical companies are making the most of the way that the patent law is designed. Patent law is probably written uh, with the greatest equity of any laws in the United States. It's as available to a homeless person as it is to the richest corporation. And uh, the process to achieve protection for a device is uh, quite straightforward and it's very equitable. And so it wasn't really designed for pharmaceutical companies, but the pharmaceutical companies, companies and the device companies, they need this to survive in order to continue to contribute to healthcare in the United States. So the government has said, if you invest billions, which they are doing billions in the patient care every year, $83 billion a year, we will protect you because you are doing the most work to help us continue to move the dial forward. Uh, we will protect you. We will give you protection for your innovations and we will let you make some money off of it. Now, the U.S. has the most expensive health care in the world. And it becomes evident why that is when you start to think about the 
where the corporations exist that produce the largest output in research for healthcare progress. They're almost all in the US. There, now there are some in Europe, some in Switzerland, but they are largely American companies. And the one thing I can say that is um, a strength of the American justice system is that they will go to bat for their American inventors. And if an American corporation decides to produce a drug and sell it and name their price, whatever they need to make in order to make back the money that was required to develop that drug or device, the, the American court system will protect them. They will defend them against copycats and reverse engineers and all those things. But when they try to go sell it in another country, it's a whole different ball game. So they're fighting against people who are trying to reverse engineer and copy their products and manufacture them and sell them sort of under the table because those court systems have not historically protected American innovators well. And so if a US healthcare corporation wants to make a difference in the world, the only people they can charge for the, the change for the whole world are the US consumers. So we are paying for the development or progress of the entire world's healthcare. And that's one of the reasons, and there, there are many reasons, but that's one of the reasons why US healthcare is so expensive. Now I wanna take a break here because I think we've gone through a lot of stuff and a lot of theoretical stuff. Uh, we've got a couple more cases to discuss, but I thought we would uh, touch base and see if there are any questions. So Philip, what are the next steps about how, are you gonna look for a pharma partner now or what, what's your plan? Yeah, so we are in actually awaiting a response from the NIH for another STTR grant, uh, Small Business Technology Transfer and Research Grant, that would be for another approximately $200,000 to finish our specific aims in animal models. The questions we're asking now are, does our drug increase, uh, 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 decrease mortality and prolong lifespan in animals? Once we get that data, we are off to the races as far as generating interest from ph pharmaceutical companies to buy us out. Now, the, the reality is that the Alzheimer's market is absolutely dreaded by corporate pharma. Within the last 15 years, Dr. Fowler, if you had to guess, what do you think is the success rate of lead molecules that make it to the FDA? It's, it's gotta be small. It's, it's gotta be really low. 99.8% failure. Jesus. Talk about a way to waste your money. If you're a corporate pharmaceutical entity, right, is to invest in Alzheimer's. That's why it's one of the most well-funded uh, areas of research by government because someone has to fund it and the corporations just struggle to see incentive because they're concerned that they're going to invest that $83 billion a year and get no output. It's going to make and no yet the flip side of that is the most expensive part of medicine just about is taking care of older people, their surgeries, their mm -hmm. assisted living, their nursing home care. Um, it is a, it's got to be one of the big, big dollars for Medicare. And if there is some way to be able to take folks into very advanced old age and still being able to be, you know, conducting their activities of daily living and so forth, you know, it would be a remarkable cost saving for the government. Yes. In yeah, fact, take it away, Taylor. <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. Take it away, Taylor. Do you have any final comments you wanted to make? Oh, yeah, sure. Okay. I was going to just comment on that, Dr. Fowler. In fact, the entire community of folks doing Alzheimer's research were kind of held in bated breath over the last couple of years because there was one drug going through the FDA approval process. It was in phase three trials called aducanumab. And they recently were given approval for this drug at the last, at like finally, we've got something that's gotten through, maybe this has promise. And they had a publication showing efficacy for mortality benefit and improvement in memory retention. And right after the FDA approved it, they, with, they redacted their study on efficacy. And this is a hot topic now in our world uh, because we've just for the first time passed a monoclonal antibody to treat Alzheimer's disease. And finally, we have some hope. And right after getting approved, they, they had to redact their study. It was also fabulously expensive. As you know, I've <laughs> asked you before and teased you, do you, <clears throat> do you watch CNN? And none of my residents or students watch CNN. I'm the only one I know that does. 
CNN is kind of interesting because they have five minutes of programming followed by five minutes of commercials, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And the first two minutes of the commercial breaks are always the new Abalaba maps, you know, the, the new monoclonals or the, the IBS, you know, the immune system uh, uh, active chemicals. And, you know, you see the folks saying, well, finally, I'm taking Humira and my skin is all clear. I don't have psoriasis, any, psoriasis anymore. And they're celebrating and everybody's happy. And, and nobody mentions they're paying $60,000 a year to have clear skin. How in the Lord's name do we pay for this stuff? But go ahead. Yeah, Taylor's got a bunch of questions. We've, uh, we, you've already got 354 people listening to you, by the way, Philip. And, uh, oh, wonderful. They, they are hot to hear what you have to say tonight. So, uh, Taylor, take it away. Okay. So this is kind of relating to what you were just talking about. Um, reading the question made me kind of think of a little bit more to ask, but it says, even if a treatment is cheap to produce, um, it will still be marked up by manufacturers. How do you work against it in the hospital setting? And so then you also said that like it might cost $83 billion a year for some company to keep this drug being produced. How much revenue are they actually generating? Like, are they really overpricing it or is it just feel that way? Cause it's expensive to us. Here's, here's what I will, the argument I will make. I, I certainly think that there are overpriced medications. Absolutely. And I think that our system, like our uh, internationally, our healthcare system is broken in a way that uh, if we had more in, uh, defensible and enforceable uh, structures for intellectual property throughout the world, that we can bring the prices down because we're sort of establishing more equitable pricing throughout the world. Here's what I'll say. <clears throat> the next drug that works for Alzheimer's is gonna break the bank for everybody. Doesn't matter what drug it is, it doesn't matter how much better it is than the previous one, as long as there's this much benefit over all the other treatments, it is gonna absolutely break the bank. And why do I say that? It's because over the last 15 years, the FDA approval rate has been 0.02% or, or 0.2%. So all of these corporations have been investing for the last 15 years, billions of dollars every single year. And you might say, well, that one drug wasn't really that expensive to develop, but it took them a hundred failures to get there as well. And they're trying to recuperate the costs that they ex expensed for that research. And unfortunately it, falls largely upon the American consumer to pay for it. Um, but that being what it is, uh, I do think that there is a role for the government in regulating to some degree the price of medications and assisting to cover the price of those medications for folks who truly need it, especially if a corporation tries to pull off a stunt where they charge so much for the medication that no one can buy it. Like what good do we really do if no one can afford the medication? And so I think that's something that uh, our federal government takes uh, looks into and kind of responds to. And we really saw a, a satisfying response with the hepatitis B uh, medication that was released, the uh, antiviral medication, when it initially the, the, the course of treatment was $80,000 uh, to treat acute hepatitis B infection. And within a couple of months, it had come down to about 15 to 20 grand total. Uh, after multiple uh, grants were uh, developed, essentially, they, they, they created a fund to give out the grants to fund the programs like Medicare and Medicaid that need to pay for this drug. Uh, unfortunately, I think it is a product of our system that the medications are so expensive. So, Philip, if uh, ivermectin is good for COVID, isn't it good for Alzheimer's? I think so. We should give it a shot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, Taylor, I interrupted. You're fine. Um, another question is, how do patent systems work for ND PhD research? Does the university get the right to the intellectual property when the person who made it is a student? I love this question. So the, every institution has a different policy. And the reality is that it's largely dependent on the combination of inventors whose names would go onto the patent application. So if even one person who works within the institution is named on that patent application and has a duty to assign their rights to the university, you're gonna deal with a significant battle to try to protect your rights as an independent owner or assignee of that patent. And we'll talk a little bit more about the terms when we go through patent systems later. But um, 
most institutions have a reimbursement program. I work at UT Southwestern and when I invent something and I patent it through my university, they pay for everything. They pay for the patent expenses, they pay the patent attorneys, they pay for commercialization and marketing and they, do, they use their legal teams for licensing. And after they recuperate all of the costs that they spent, they give me back 40% of the revenues or the royalties, I should say. I get 40% straight back to me. Another 20% goes to my department or my research lab if I have one so that I can continue to work on that or develop new solutions. And then sundry other percentages end up going to other departments and the board of, um, uh, the board of regents. Uh, but many universities have a policy for that. And if you contact your intellectual property department or your department of general counsel, they can give you advice. They can also give you advice on how to navigate inventing something without using university resources so that you own it outright. In fact, I've developed a device recently uh, where I work with students at one institution and I work with faculty at another. And I specifically spoke with the institution with the students in advance to make sure that we didn't break any rules. And as long as we didn't break rules, the, we didn't have to deal with any of those issues. So it's worth asking the question before you start. That's good to know. Um, somebody wanted to know, would you mind sharing your experience about going to business school before attending medical school and how has it helped you? Um, how has it helped you? I find this super interesting. Oh, sure. So going to business school was probably the best accident of my life. I was an undergrad and I met my uh, future wife is now my wife. And she was a year behind me. And I was very eager to go off to medical school. I always knew I wanted to go to medical school. My dad was in business and was very successful at a time and was surrounded by wealthy people. And he always told me, son, don't go into business. Don't do what I do. It's miserable. Look at all these happy doctors do that. And he demanded that I do it so that he could live vicariously through me. And so I, you know, I took to it. And, um, to kind of stick it to the man in undergrad, I did research on cotton instead of healthcare, but eventually found my way back. Uh, but because I had a year to spare because I wanted to uh, move with my wife wherever we went, I decided to do a master's in business. And I wasn't really sure what I was going to get out of it. But boy, am I glad I did. What I'll tell you is that there is some value in the content of the courses. And my program is specifically focused on uh, leadership and managerial skills for like kind of CEO training, whereas some programs are focused more on financial skills and accounting and what have you, organizational management. Uh, but what business school does the most for you is the networking. I, I got an opportunity I never would have thought to work at a patent office. I started a pharmaceutical company because I was looking for ways to apply the skill. I ended up starting a, uh, a company called an intellectual property boutique that I ran for a couple of years in which we did patent uh, analysis and prior art searches for inventors. And I never would have dreamed of the possibility of doing anything like that because I was just gonna be a doctor. And what I think business school did for me was just open doors and kind of broaden my perspective. And is it worth the 20 grand or 40 grand or whatever it costs you? I'll, I'll be honest, I was fortunate enough to be well, to, to get a significant scholarship to do it. Uh, but would I do it again? I would do it three times over. It was priceless. My mom keeps telling me that I should study business stuff because apparently doctors don't know how to handle business well. I would say that's probably true. Or bad <laughs> investors, but not you, of course. Um, so let's see, um, how do you go about conversing with physicians that might not agree with your innovations that you want um, to propose? Interesting question. I would say that people are largely um, responsive to it. Everyone really seems to be interested in this industry. And I'm not talking about pharmaceuticals per se or Alzheimer's, but you'll see from my other cases soon that what I really do most these days is devices. Uh, everybody's really interested and everybody has an idea that they want to share, which I think is so exciting. Uh, I, every now and then I come across someone who just isn't so excited about it. And the reality is I just kind of brush it off my shoulders because I enjoy what I do. I, I picked a job that brings me joy and I'm, I ain't going to let the haters hate, you know? Okay. I agree. Um, and so 
if you have an idea, like what would you say the first step is in getting the ball rolling? If you want, you, you thought of a device, you don't know where to start, you know, you're Dr. Fowler. You're like, I have this idea. I want to use this, but I've never done what you've done. So. Yeah. I think that is a great question that I address soon, but in summary, delegate tasks, find people who are learning the skills you need and acquire <clears throat> those skills through relationships. Those are going to be the things that help you most. So when I was first starting out with devices, I had no clue how to do 3D modeling or computer-aided design, no clue. And fortunately, I have a wife who does. And so I learned from her. And I also am at a university that has an attached engineering department. And so I went and talked to engineering students and asked them how to do things. And they were really eager to get involved in projects because they needed projects. They needed capstone projects just as much as we need to shadow and we need to do our basic research experiences to apply to medical school. There are so many people who wanna be involved. And if you can just do a little bit to inspire them, you'll make a friend for life as well. So I think that it's all about delegating and finding friends and asking mentors questions. I'm always open and I love talking about device stuff and pharma stuff and would just love to kind of get involved in projects with people who have ideas. I'm looking for them all the time. This is a really welcoming group of people, the innovation group. We just, we just love this stuff and we want to do more of it. So just ask for help. Awesome. Well, good to know. Um, Dr. Fowler, did you have any specific question that stood out to you that you think I should answer or ask? Some of the questions that are written, I don't really understand how. Yeah, I, I, are Philip, I think you've answered it mostly, but I think maybe we'll conclude this this particular Q&A session by saying. And by the way, the, the student participation here that they, they, nobody has left, they, they seem to be very interested in the business approach that parallels a medicine approach. I guess I would ask you, do you. Because I work with you as a doctor, I know you. You're a great doc. You're a smart guy. You work hard. You love people, and so forth. Is the business part distracting for you as a doctor? Yes, I must say it is, and it's not. It is mostly because I just enjoy it so much that I want to spend time doing it. This is something I enjoy, and I meet with uh, engineering students on a weekly basis for a couple hours just to work on devices for things that I'm not even optimistic will turn out. Just so that I can work with engineering students and go through the process and kind of practice this skill set because I enjoy it so much. Now, when I'm on shift, fortunately as an ER doctor, we're like designed to be able to turn on and off our brain for the job. And so when I show up to work, I'm there to work and I see patients and I enjoy that part of my life too. I signed up for this specialty for a reason. Uh, one is that the patients are sick and it's so rewarding to make a difference in their life because they're there with an emergency. This is the worst day of their life and they came to ask me for help. And so the one thing I can do is listen and make a difference by trying to you know, help them. Uh, but, and so following on to that, thank you. I, I didn't mean to interrupt. Following on to that though, just to be right on point, but you are also an inventor and you're thinking all the time. It's, you know, some of it's in the back of your mind, not even, even in your conscious mind, but if some of the students listening tonight would like to do what you're doing, do, do, they need, do they need to do their master's first or can they do it after medical school and residency training? You know, I think the better model is to actually do it later. I spent, really? Yeah, I spent most of medical school not really sure how to apply what I had learned. And when I started getting interested in devices, I was largely sort of reteaching myself what I had forgotten. But if you, I think with just a couple of lectures on sort of what to look out for and how to recognize opportunities to innovate, you can start to develop sort of a, a laundry list of opportunities and take that with you into business school so that you've already got that sort of fodder to work with when you're going through the processes of developing, uh, you know, market strategies and understanding the principles of economics and finance, because you'll already have these ideas in mind uh, with which to apply those skills that you're developing. I think it actually makes more sense that way. I, I did not do a <clears throat> master's and I've been a clinician for over 40 years, but there are ideas are burning in my mind. For example, <clears throat> I am, there's one of three reasons that I don't know something when I'm working with you. I either never knew it and there's plenty of that, or I forgot it and there's plenty of that. Wait till you hit nearly 70 <laughs> or it's all brand new. And um, 
for example, th there's so much that a machine learning could assist with because machines don't get tired. Whereas you and I at the end of 11 hour shifts and our feet are killing us, we're hungry, we, gotta, we need to pee and we're hypoglycemic, you know, and we're tired and irritated and the nurses won't shut up and it's just loud, loud and noisy and so forth. And it's hard to concentrate. Um, machine learning in that setting that could assist us in creating differential diagnoses safely would be very helpful. You had mentioned before in our prior discussion about what MIT was doing with Deaconess Beth Israel. Are you going to get into some uh, AI stuff later or you want to talk about it now? I actually don't go into AI stuff with this talk. What you'll find is that the last couple of cases are specifically designed to kind of help people who are starting out to do things that are a little bit simpler because the, the reality is that developing a new Alzheimer's therapeutic is anything but simple. And I think that the best way to start is just to get your feet wet with something that is mechanical, that is pragmatic and is easily iteratable, re, like you, that you can iterate through, you know, to, to fail with an Alzheimer's therapeutic and try to iterate a second time takes decades. But what I'm going to propose in the next couple of cases is much simpler than that so that you can. Well, iterate. Yeah, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's move into that because I, I think the students really want to hear it. Yeah, let's do it. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the patent system to kind of reinforce what we discussed and kind of give you guys an idea of how to approach this if you come across an opportunity to innovate. So we discussed intellectual property, which is sort of like the overarching philosophy, whereas patents are the nuts and bolts. So patents require inventions and inventions are described as new solutions that have three features. They're gonna be they're gonna have utility, which is just a, the technical term for usefulness. Essentially, you're not allowed to patent anything that isn't useful. Now, this is the easiest criteria to meet because um, you know, it's in the eye of the beholder how useful the given idea is. And uh, so people are rarely rejected on this basis when they apply for a patent. The second is novelty. The reality is that you can only patent things that you actually came up with, and that sounds fair. Uh, you can only protect things that you developed. And defining novelty and trying to determine whether what you came up with is truly novel is a, is a, a field all itself. It's called the field of prior art. And if at any point you think you've come up with a new idea, here's what I want you to do. I want you to go to Google but not the normal one. I want you to go to Google Patents. You can search Google what? Google Patents. Oh. And then on Google Patents, I want you to describe in four words or less what your device, your imagined device or solution does. And then just see what exists. You would not believe what already exists. If you think that the world is comprised of the things you see on a regular basis, you are far off because so many people have invented things that never made it to market. In fact, the vast majority of inventions and the vast majority of patents do not make it to market and don't make anybody any money. I'll say that again. Patents, by and large, do not make people money because you have to not only have a patent, you have to have a market, you have to have a commercialization strategy, you have to have a, a customer base and a need. The patent is just the start. The last thing you need for an invention is for it to be non-obvious. And this is the most challenging thing to explain uh, with regard to patents. I struggle with it every time, but imagine this person that we call Posita. Posita is an acronym, it stands for person of ordinary skill in the art. Meaning if you're developing a medical device, Posita is the world's best clinician. Or if you're developing a device for a new type of oil, <coughs> your Posita is the world's best petroleum engineer. And what you create cannot just be a simple combination of things that already exist that you put together that came from that industry. Because Posita would look at that and say, oh yeah, that's so obvious anybody could have done that. We just didn't because we didn't think it would work. Just because something might work or may not work is not enough for a patent. It also has to be non-obvious. And that is the most difficult thing to describe. And it's the thing that most commonly results in people having their patent applications rejected. 
So let's move on. The next stage in the patent system is to actually apply for one. And while anybody can do it, you could sit down right now and write a patent application for a modified cup that sits upside down without water falling out. You know, it would probably be re rejected on the basis of utility because it defies gravity, uh, but you could do that. And you could submit it today and establish a filing date and become a potential patent holder. You know, the, the process would be started. All you need to do is write up your enabling disclosure, which describes exactly how it works so that anybody could, uh, a person, particularly a person of ordinary skill in the art, could uh, copy it and do it themselves. And then you just pay the application fee. That's it. And the reality is that the application fee is quite small. In fact, if you have never attempted to patent anything before and you're not part of a corporation, you are known as a micro entity and you can file a patent application for free the first time. The second time is 80 bucks. And then the price starts to go up from there the more you invent because they don't want people abusing the system. Uh, but then after you file it, there are some additional fees that start to accumulate. And we don't need to go into all the details, but suffice to say that patent applications are very cheap. It is not the application that's expensive. It's actually writing the patent application that is expensive. And that's because of a, a statistic that we're gonna discuss very soon. And it might change your mind about how you write your patent application. The last item in the process is patent prosecution, which is essentially everything that happens after you've submitted your application. So you came up with your device, you tested it, you kind of came up with all the specific features that you want to claim as your own. And then once you submit it, it is now in the hands of the government to decide, does your patent application meet those features of utility, novelty, and non-obviousness? They're going to review it. They're going to compare it to other inventions. They're going to try to decide whether what you describe is too broad. You can't say that you created a cure-all. You have to be specific. Uh, they're also going to send you office actions when they find issues. An office action is when the reviewer, uh, the person or examiner it, who is examining your patent application, finds an issue. They send it back to you and you have a certain amount of time to respond and make edits to your application. And then the last phase is hopefully issuance. It could be rejection. Uh, and an issuance is when they have allowed your patent and they are issuing you a contract with them that says that you are given the rights to that patent for X amount of time based on the type of industry and patent application that was submitted. So let's talk a little bit more about invention and kind of break these things down a little bit. Now, when we're inventing things, you have to identify a need. If you invent something without a need, it's gonna fall flat on its face. You can submit a patent application if you wanna hang it on your wall, but you're never gonna make a difference in society if people don't need it. So the steps are sort of simple. You just you identify and assess a problem. And this could be virtually anything, particularly in healthcare. Anytime where you think, gosh, that was annoying, or that took longer than it should have, or why does it cost so much? Why isn't my patient able to get access to that? Anytime you ask that question, you have encountered an opportunity to innovate. And then the next step is to look at the existing solutions. And I'm gonna tell you, go to Google Patents and just search your idea and see what exists out there. You wouldn't believe what already exists. And then the last thing is to assess the pain points. This is all about finding a, uh, a product market fit. And it's really the key to success in the, uh, this phase called the needs finding phase or identifying needs phase is that you wanna make sure that the, you are creating a product that also has a market. And so the, the market has to like the product. The product has to be affordable enough for the market to use. And everything that prevents that from happening all those features or things that the, the public might have an issue with are known as pain points. And so you're going to have to address those pain points in the process of innovating and iterating your design so that you make sure that what you develop is truly marketable. So next is a, a little bit more convoluted. It's about assessing the market. And so this again is about fit and value. You constantly reassess this as you modify your device and iterate with time. You also wanna worry about preparedness and make sure that what you're developing is actually uh, something that the market is prepared for. You know, Just because you come up with an AI solution to read chest x-ray doesn't mean that physicians are gonna let you sell it yet because it's intimidating. It takes jobs away from our radiologists. And so preparedness is a feature that you have to assess 
and try to either convince people they need or to make sure that they truly need before you actually pursue it. And then the last one there is competition. So that kind of builds back on existing solutions and looking at what already exists in the patent literature, but also considering what other people are working on right now. So if you're in a pharmaceutical company developing an Alzheimer's drug candidate, you have to also consider the fact that there's an FDA, a, a drug and FDA approval process that might steal the market. And so if your medication is also successful, but not quite as successful, you essentially have done nothing for society. The next one is brainstorming. And so this is where after trying to address the pain points in your device, you start to try to build it and try to come up with ways to make it manufacturable. You talk with experts about how you actually make it work. And what you'll find up to this point is that your idea was really great in theory, but it doesn't work if you can't build it or if you can't build it cheaply or if you can't build it quickly or if you can't transport it where it needs to go because it's too big or cumbersome or what have you. And this is the phase I love the most because I am a nerd and I like engineering a lot. And so I work in CAD or computer aided design, particularly I use this one, it's called Onshape. There's a free access online and it allows you to design, to design things in three dimensions. And so whenever I come up with an idea and I've kind of gone through those first few steps and made sure that what I'm thinking about may have a, a uh, product market fit, I go into CAD and I just start to tinker. And I use CAD to kind of uh, flesh out the 3D details, the dimensions, the size, the shapes, how things are gonna work so that I can kind of get my, my thoughts and my brain down on paper. It also helps communicate the device. Imagine trying to communicate the thing on this screen to somebody. There's just no way. I still, I can still, I still can't describe what I'm seeing on this screen, uh, but it at least gives us a, some hope. And so that is also a helpful component, which I have found is that if you can design something in 3D and create a picture, it helps you tell the story. And this is all about iterating and trying things over and over and over. Here's some pictures from devices I've worked on in the past. On the left, there's a, uh, this is, relates to total knee arthroplasty. It's a modified approach to decrease something called bone shielding when you place metal on bone and then stress it. You know, bones tend to allow the metal to take over all the work of loading the weight. And so the bone starts to erode over time. And so we tried to come up with a modified approach to put plates and things together to try to reload the bone so that it doesn't wear down over time. The top one there that has the box with the pretty colors in it was a solution uh, to a problem about trying to train healthcare providers how to respond to a threatening patient who's trying to grab you and hit you, God forbid, but it happens. And so this device is actually a backpack that you wear and it's attached to a bunch of blood pressure cuffs that go on your arms and legs, around your neck, around your belly. And then you essentially wear this VR device and you live through scenarios of people being attacked by an aggressive patient. And then the device actually grabs you and it squeezes you and it helps you develop a gut response to get yourself free so that in the moment you don't panic. The next one down here is some silicone stuck to some adhesive and I'm not allowed to tell you what it's about because it's not patented yet. And if I tell you about it today, it would count as a public disclosure which is something that would prohibit me from protecting it in the future. And that's why I include it. Suffice to say that what's in that picture is not an enabling disclosure. And so it's not going to prohibit me from still applying for a patent application. And I included it for that reason, to mention that you can't just go off telling people about your ideas until you've protected it. And then there's another really pretty 3D model of the stress shielding issue and the total knee arthroplasty approach that we were working on in that first picture. So let's jump back a little bit. So how do I actually do this on a daily basis? The reality is that I do not have the time to design all this stuff myself regularly and test it and come up with plans to market these things. Instead, I just work with really eager students who need projects. And so fortunately through UT Southwestern, we have a relationship with UT Dallas and they have a bunch of senior engineering students who are looking for projects. It's called the UT Design Capstone Program. Every senior engineering student has to do a project and they work in teams of five or six people. And so every year I just pitch one or two ideas to them. And then I meet with them weekly while they work on it. And I learn as much from them as they do from me. And we just kind of develop solutions to these kind of common everyday problems that we want to fix. And in a few minutes, we'll go over a couple that were actually completed and have kind of finished the whole capstone course. 
so let's jump back here real quick. So the next step will be after brainstorming is to actually build it and test it. So you've got to make a prototype and you've got to make one that actually works in the application that you want to use it. Uh, there's something called a Pareto type that you can produce prior to a prototype, but that's a whole different thing. It's about marketing and showing people what the device might look like, but a prototype is something you can actually test. You'll also have to come up with ways to sterilize it if it relates to a procedure or if it's a device and needs to be introduced into patients. And so when you're designing and brainstorming, you have to come up with materials that are compatible with the sterilization processes. Next comes regulatory approval. My goodness, this is a big one and I'm not even gonna touch it today because it is so big, but suffice to say that everything that goes into on or near a patient needs approval from the government. And there are easy things, that, there are things that can get approval easily if they're very simple and non-invasive. And then there are things that take years and years to develop and require significant effort to get approved. And then the next phase, is to again iterate. I just mention it here because you're gonna be doing it all along the way, but you're gonna iterate not just on the shape or the design of the device. You might also iterate on the route of delivery if it's a medication. Is it usually given through an IV? Is it given intraosseous? Is it given subcutaneous, orally? Is it topical? These things can all be iterated on as well. And then you can iterate on your market. And this is the most interesting one that actually manifests itself commonly among successful businesses, which is that once you have created a device or a drug or a process, and you think you know what you're doing, the market proves you wrong and says, oh no, this does not work in this market, but man, it sure would fit over here. And there are countless examples of drugs and devices that find new markets. And we call this pivoting in business. And it's actually a frustrating term because the really sales, uh, salesy type of people use it incessantly. We pivoted here and then pivoted there and then we found our market by pivoting. And uh, it is the truth that this is the most common uh, sort of hurdle that these companies face in sort of the mid, mid stage of development. And then the last thing is you actually have to develop some interest by marketing. And so you got to commercialize the device. You have to make it ready for the market. You have to promote it by talking to the right people, the people that are in that target market and trying to sell them on the benefits and trying to convince them that there aren't pain points associated with your device. And then you have to deal with those sales and licensing people at the end. So we went over eligibility a little bit. So those components were utility, they were novelty and non-obviousness. I don't think we have to uh, trudge through that anymore because we've kind of dealt with it. So the, this leads to another question, you know, if you're gonna actually go through this process, should you use a patent attorney? And I just wanted to address it. We don't have to spend long on it, but I just wanna make a case that you really should. A patent application is very cheap. We can do it for a couple hundred dollars on average after all of the review fees and the prior art fees and everything, but you could give it to a patent attorney to write. And the question is, does that make a difference in your likelihood of success? So any patent application that fails to achieve issuance is described as abandoned, whether it's because it was rejected or whether it's because you failed to respond to an email what have you, or failed to, failed to pay a fee, we call, call all of that, we, that all falls under the umbrella of an abandonment. And for those applicants who used a patent attorney to write the application and assist them with the communication process, 35% end up abandoning. But those who are pro se applicants, the people who write it themselves and try to deal with it on their own, have a 76% chance of abandonment. If you go it alone, your chances of success are low. They are against you. So I would make the case to use a patent attorney if you are serious and you think you've got a market to justify the three to $8,000 that you would spend. Now, if you're applying for a patent application in the US, that's about how much you expect to spend. But if you're going to apply for a patent internationally and you wanna apply in Europe and Japan and China and elsewhere, these can get very expensive. I'm talking a hundred grand. So I would start small, work your way up, develop some interest in your device if you're thinking about going internationally, or if you're like me and you work in a healthcare institution, just let the university take care of it. Assign those rights away, get what royalties you can and let them deal with this headache because it really is one. Those aren't equal numbers. I think the more initiated among you picked up on that. So just to kind of rehash, 
application features that you will need are an enabling disclosure, the application fee, and what is called a filing date. Now, in the United States, we operate under a precedence known as the first to file law. This was a new law that was passed in, I believe, 2007. And essentially what it said was, you know, this whole system was designed to motivate people to tell the world what they're doing and how to do it. But if we only give people protection because they were the first inventor and no one else can kind of compete with them for those rights, that kind of still incentivizes them to keep it a secret because patents have a lifespan. And if you can keep it a trade secret, you can, you can lengthen the time of protection. Think about Coca-Cola, nobody knows the recipe. It's been a hundred years and they've kept it trade secret and there's no patent telling us how to make it. And so they, they benefit from that. But the US kind of recognized that there's a benefit to switching from a first to invent precedence to a first to file precedence. This means that if you developed the Coca-Cola flavor and I later developed it and filed a patent application on it and they grant it to me, I can steal it from you and you would lose Coca-Cola. You'd lose the whole thing. Now, of course, there are issues about whether it would truly be a novel application or a non-obvious application at that point, but it is what it is. Uh, so if you develop, if you have an opportunity to patent, uh, you should because other people are chomping at the bit to take it away from you. So this leaves us in the patent prosecution phase. This is when you've filed your application. Maybe you have a patent attorney assisting you. You're given that priority date or that filing date. You've paid your fee. And then people are gonna start reviewing. Uh, these are examiners who work for the government. In fact, there are only two offices in the United States where the examiners exist. One's in West Virginia, the other one's here in Dallas. One of the two is located right here in Dallas. In fact, I, uh, I play Dance Dance Revolution with a friend who works there uh, on the weekend. Uh, they do a prior art search. So they're doing the same thing as you where they're looking at Google patents to see whether something similar exists. They're examining your patent application to see if it actually meets the merits for patent uh, consideration. And then they're performing office actions to let you know what issues they find along the way. And then lastly, finally, you get your patent. They issue it to you. I wish that were the end, but there are still opportunities to extend your application. There's the prospect of litigation in which you have to sue somebody for infringing upon your patent. And all of those things are defined within the US Code 35, but we won't get into it. So these things cost some money, but the examiners review them and then you get your patent. Congrats. So here's that trade-off one last time. If you are willing to uh, disclose your invention, you'll get these exclusive rights, but how long does it last? I think that's our next question. Now for a utility patent, which is a thing that relates to devices and processes and manufacturing systems and software and all sorts of things like that, the duration is about 20 years. And I say approximately 20 years because they actually subtract a little time after your filing date for every time they have emailed you and something's waiting in your inbox for you to respond while they're evaluating it. Uh, but they deduct all the time that they spend evaluating the invention on there. And so people generally come out with about 20 years of time left. And then patent ownership is also kind of a confusing topic because patents aren't actually property. The intellectual property is. A patent is just a contract. It's an agreement. It's so pat patents are not owned. They are assigned. It's an agreement between you and the government. And they can belong to different people, like we discussed earlier in the question section. Uh, they can belong to you, the inventor. They can belong to academic institutions, or they can belong to corporations. The largest among these, the ones that have the most, are the corporations. They file for patents like nobody's business on a daily basis. And interestingly enough, there's a few people in the United States called super inventors because the corporations specify someone in the company as the designated inventor for every item that they file a patent application on, even though that person wasn't truly in the, the inventor, it's their prerogative to do that. And so there are a couple inventors in the patent literature who have invented tens of thousands of things in their lifetime because the company keeps using their name. Let's jump into a case. I think we've talked enough about all this kind of uh, legal stuff and just talk about some cases. We'll do two more cases. All right, so we've got a 29 year old woman who was admitted to the hospital for hemarthrosis, which is essentially bleeding into the joint for some reason. 
And this was due to a chronic condition. Unfortunately, she's suffering from hemophilia A, which is a congenital condition of bleeding. Her blood does not develop, have all the coagulation factors and things it needs to prevent her from bleeding unnecessarily. And she is admitted and she's undergoing these routine morning blood draws to trend various markers in her coagulation cascade and things we track in medicine to make sure people are healthy. Uh, and the patient's also given some morphine for her, her pain and her knee. 30 minutes after the phlebotomist leaves, after completing the blood draw procedure, a nurse goes in to evaluate the patient. The patient's asleep, but also the nurse notices that her right hand has some purple discoloration. She's like, what is going on here? Sure enough, the phlebotomist forgot to take off the tourniquet. Is this a problem? Heck yeah, it's a problem. It's a relatively uncommon one. We'll talk about the market for it, uh, but it does exist. And it was a project that one of our faculty members was interested in solving and they came to me asking for help. And so there are actually some guidelines out there about how to approach phlebotomy and when to put a tourniquet on and remove a tourniquet. So we'll just kind of walk through the process of how a blood draw works. Essentially, you take a tourniquet, which is a thermoplastic elastomer material, which means it's just a stretchy band, and it's tied around an arm or a leg, and you tie it tight enough to block off the venous drainage from that limb so that the veins plump up. They start to accumulate more blood. And then you wipe it a little bit with an alcohol swab to make sure you don't introduce infection with the needle, and then you actually puncture the vein and you collect some blood. After that, you should release the tourniquet before removing the needle. Otherwise, the vein is still very dilated. It has developed increased pressure, and that increases the risk of bleeding from that site after you remove the needle. This is a simple procedure that we do countless times a day in the hospital. Unfortunately, things can go wrong if you forget the tourniquet, if you leave it on. And so there was actually a study in 2016 looking at all the patients in Pennsylvania through the Pennsylvania Patient Safety Authority uh, to see how often this was occurring. And approximately 1,400 events of forgotten phlebotomy tourniquets were noted uh, in a two-year period in Pennsylvania. And so it's not a crazy amount, but there are also not a ton of people in Pennsylvania. So there's a decent degree of risk associated with going to a hospital and a good chance that if you have a tourniquet placed on you, it may not come off at the right time. And so we can kind of break this down a little bit and see who's forgetting them. Well, 47% of the time, it was during phlebotomy. That could be performed by a nurse or a phlebotomist, but it was occurring during that procedure of phlebotomy. 32% occurred during IV insertion when we're actually leaving a catheter in the vein so that we have constant vascular access for that patient. And then 20% of the cases were unidentified just because there was no clear, it wasn't clear in the chart what, what was going on when the event occurred. And then a very, very small population is among surgical cases and other. Now, if we look at how long the phlebotomy tourniquet remained on the patient's arms after, uh, after it was forgotten, we have data on that too. So about 43% or so were discovered within an hour. I assume those patients were awake and were like, hey, what's this thing? Take it off and maybe took it off. Uh, but then there's a significant percentage of the, uh, this patient population that did not discover it within an hour. So they had this thing on for at least an hour causing venous congestion in the arm that increases risks of all sorts of conditions. And so this is something that we thought might be worthwhile to work on. So why do we care? What are the risks of prolonged venous stasis, which is fancy terminology for letting the blood pool in one area for a long time without active uh, flow, laminar flow in particular? Uh, one is venous thromboembolism, which is also a big fancy word for blood clots that could develop in that arm. And in fact, the patient I described in the case did have an upper extremity blood clot in her arm. You can also develop ischemia if the phlebotomy tourniquet is on tight enough to compress arterial blood flow as well. You can also de develop paresthesias or sort of tingling sensations and neurologic findings from compression of the nerves. That's very similar to neuropathy. And then sort of the long-term things and things that hospitals are most concerned about and healthcare systems are concerned about is reduced quality of life because people develop a condition and then have to start a medication and then have complications from the medication and so on and so forth. And it can have a long-term significance on patient care. And lastly, litigation. There is a precedence for people in hospitals, particularly getting sued because phlebotomy tourniquets are being left on patients. So if we could fix this issue with a device that would make this stop happening, that would just be great. So uh, a project was born 
and we titled it the disposable and self-releasing phlebotomy tourniquet. Uh, this guy's afraid of needles, though I don't really believe him. So here's a normal tourniquet, quite simple, right? It's a rectangle. It's a stretchy, stretchy rectangle that you can tie around the arm to compress the veins. It's quite simple and you only need to wear it for a little while, but of course we're forgetting it and so it's staying on longer. And there's some features of phlebotomy tourniquets. You know, the material they choose and the thickness of the materials are actually all picked very cleverly by the engineers that developed these things so that they do their job and nothing else. And so the question was posed, well, how much tension do you need when you put a phlebotomy tourniquet on? So what we did was we had nurses put them on a bunch of patients and then measure the section that was stretched around the arm and then uh, sort of reenacted that using a tensile tester, which you can see on the right side of the screen to measure how much tensile force is being generated by a nurse when she or he applies a tourniquet. And that falls somewhere between 7.5 to 10 newtons of tensile force. This is very small, but it is a number. And now we have a sort of uh, a guide as to what we need to achieve with our device for compression of the veins. And so, um, this device, whatever we, uh, whatever is developed needs to apply tension uh, that honestly can differ between providers because different people put them on with different degrees of tightness. It must achieve sufficient venous compression to actually assist with the vena puncture procedure. It needs to be able to fit on different size limbs and large people, small people, arms and legs. And it needs to have a comparable time to, time to failure no matter which, uh, which approach you use to apply the device. And we use the term perforation here because it was our solution. So this is a simple solution, guys. We kind of came up with 20 ways we could make this work and lots of them are expensive and involve like self-releasing glues and things that warm up when you put them on the skin so that the, it would warm up and release once the glue kind of melts. We came up with different types of foams that slowly expand and only expand at a certain rate when held under tens tensile force. And then finally, as all of these teams end up doing, eventually we sort of just have this aha moment, something clicks. And for this project, it was, why don't we just cut it off? And why don't we make the device sort of cut itself off? And so what we ended up coming up with is this little device, this little blue piece here called the plastic shear edge. It has a point on the inside that comes to a, a tip. It is not sharp. You can rub it on your skin, you can't shave with it, but it is sharp enough to kind of allow a perforation that already exists to continue expanding if pulled under tension. And so when you put it on the arm, you wrap the tourniquet around the arm, you snap that little shear edge into one of the holes. And then as it cuts through this material, it works its way toward the failure control slits that we described. And once it hits that point, the whole thing just kind of catastrophically falls off. It just falls off. It doesn't pop, it doesn't fly across the room, it just falls off. And it was very satisfying. The question was whether we can control the rate at which it falls off, because we want it to fall off, you know, less than an hour, ideally within like about 10 minutes, but we don't want it to fall off in 30 seconds because the nurse is still working. So that all came down to the material properties of the tourniquets and how long we made it cut. So by changing the distance that it needs to cut through the tourniquet, we could modify how long uh, the tourniquet would stay on. By modifying the thickness of the tourniquet, it would have to cut through a thicker material and take more time. And ultimately we came up with just the right combination, which was to use a 0.35 inch cutting distance. And we use this foam roll as sort of our testing mannequin. Um, and it had a four inch diameter and we always secured it in the sixth position or the per perforation. And then we just watched them and see how long they took to fall off. And sure enough, all but two of the 97 tourniquets fell off within 45 minutes. Now there's a significant portion of them that fell off between two and 13 minutes here. So you could argue that maybe that would get in the way of the nurse's job because they're still trying to draw blood during that time. And then there was even one that snapped really early uh, when we investigated that one, there was sort of a manufacturing defect in the, in the, the shape of the perforation that was used. So it might've been a, a quality control issue, but this kind of shows that this is a very simple device. It's a tourniquet with holes in it and a little piece of plastic that we 3D printed and glued on. And yet it could resolve this issue entirely. And you have to think about your market and say, well, how much is it gonna cost the hospital? Well, hospital 
turns out the hospital pays about three cents per tourniquet. I figured that one out by just talking to the Office of Supply and Fulfillment. And the modifications we added, if kind of spread out over mass production with millions of these, would add a cent to the cost of the tourniquet. So it would go from three cents to four cents. It's a simple solution. The problem we encountered was that people did not think it was a problem. There weren't enough cases. People weren't litigating often enough and hospitals weren't losing money as a result of these injuries. And so when we sought out uh, uh, hospitals to do a larger trial on humans and we talked to corporations to see if they would be interested in the product, they said, nobody cares because there wasn't a need. So what mistake did we make? Is we didn't ask people if they wanted the solution. We just found a problem. And that goes back to needing a product market fit. And so if you can develop a, a device that solves a problem, you also need people to want a solution. So here were some of the next steps at the time when I first presented this, we were working on funding and developing a relationship with some people that could do laser cutting so that we could laser cut the the tourniquets very cheaply. And then we even designed our own uh, injection mold so that we could start to mass produce these so that we could produce much larger quantities of the part. And then we were uh, starting to plan on IRB approval and uh, designing a human trial so that we could make a bunch of these and actually test them. But alas, there isn't a market. And so we moved on to case three. And this is our last case. And this kind of will wrap up the, the discussion tonight. So here's a 70 year old woman who presents to the ER after sustaining a ground level fall. So she was walking, she was just stepping off the bottom stair on her front porch when she fell. She fell onto her left hip and it happened about four hours ago. And since then she hasn't been able to walk on it and her hip hurts and it radiates down to her knee and she's got some tingly sensations in her leg, but uh, her skin color is okay. She looks like her, her blood vessels are intact. She doesn't have blockage of her blood flow to her leg, so to speak. And she comes into the ER and because she's not walking, we're pretty concerned. So we get a CT scan, a uh, computerized tomography scan or CAT scan of her pelvis. And it shows that she has a comminuted fracture to the left acetabulum. Now that's a word. The patient was taken to surgery for open reduction and internal fixation of this fracture by the orthopedic surgeons. What are all these words? The acetabulum is a part of the pelvis and you'll see in the picture in just a moment where that exists. And then open reduction and internal fixation means that the orthopedic surgeon is actually gonna cut the patient open, lay eyes on the problem and put plates and screws in it to hold it all back together while it heals. Unfortunately, four years later, she came back for sudden failure of this plate and screw fixation system and had really terrible pelvic pain and her blood pressure was dropping. She needed blood products and it turns out that when the, when the plate and screws kind of broke out of the bone, they sheared some of the blood vessels in her pelvis and they did everything they, everything they could to stabilize her and fortunately they did. But then she got pneumonia and died while she was in the hospital. What a shame. If only the device had worked better we could have prevented a related condition. And this is, this is just so pervasive in uh, healthcare innovation that the things we develop can prevent the illness or treat the illness that we're targeting, but it can also prevent developing comorbidities too. This woman did not did actually die of her hip fracture. She died of, died of pneumonia, but she may never have caught it if she didn't have this condition. So here's a pelvis. It is a ring of bone connected to the femurs, which is sort of like a ball and socket joint. And the acetabulum is the part of the bone you actually can't see in the pelvis because it's being blocked by the ball of the ball and joint, uh, the ball and socket joint of the femur here. If I remove this femur, you would be able to see it up in here in this area. I hope you guys can see my mouse. And so there's a pattern of all the different kinds of ways you can fracture your acetabulum. Some are more common, some are less common. Uh, the most common ones I will say are the fourth one and the last one, I think the sixth one there, the fairly common fractures. And the approach has been to go in surgically and expose the bone, put plates and screws in them. But the problem is really good bone is like concrete. You can put anything into it and it's gonna stick, it's gonna stay, it's gonna hold really well. 
But these old people who are actually prone to these fractures have terrible osteoporosis, which is a wearing down of the bone that it becomes more porous over time. It becomes a lot less like concrete and a lot more like cheese. So you can imagine how well things would hold if you screwed in a block of wood to a block of cheese, it wouldn't go well. And that's what they were dealing with. In fact, the orthopedic surgeon that approached me with this project said that in his patient population, the mechanical failure rate at five years after surgery, like this lady that we discussed, is upwards of 20%. And they would have to go back to the operating room and get it fixed, or they would develop chronic illnesses associated with no longer being able to walk because they're bed bound. And it just wasn't an awful outcome. So we wanted to fix it. And so here's some just kind of like overarching effects of osteoporosis in society. You know, the US population is aging. By 2030, it's estimated that 17% of the population will be over 65. And then elderly, elderly individuals consequently represent the most rapidly growing subgroup of patients that are currently sustaining these fractures. And the incidence of these fractures is expected to double over the next 20 years. This is gonna be a big problem. So for the year 2000, there were an estimated 9 million new osteoporotic fractures of which 1.6 million were at the hip in this location that we're describing. And so the next project was born, which was a limited open acetabular fracture solution. So our problem statement was that current methods of acetabular fracture fixation depend on the mechanical properties of the bone, which I did not like because this bone was osteoporotic and there is a significant decrease in the Young's modulus, which is essentially the, the engineering term for the ability of a material to tolerate stress, whether under tension or stretching, it's less elastic, more brittle, likely to fail. And the fragility of the bone leads to screw mobility, the screws can move, and eventual plate failure because the screws essentially strip through the material. Here's what solutions usually look like. You put a plate, you put some screws. And wherever there's fractures, you put more plates, more screws. But these patients don't have a bunch of bone to be putting all these plates and screws in, so they fail. And you can see a cut, here's like an, a satisfying x-ray of what it looks like afterwards. This person also had a, uh, a fracture up here. Uh, here's one made by Acumed, one of the leading providers of solutions for this. And then a really big company that provides the majority of solutions is Stryker. And this is what one of theirs looks like. They just don't work that well. So here's the problem. The shear force causes osteoporotic comminution around screws. Essentially the bone sort of fragments near the, screw, the edges of the screw and breaks down and allows the screw to strip. And so the screws and plates loosen or strip with ambulation or walking. And then screws depend on internal Young's modulus or sort of that tolerance of elasticity and fail as a result. So we did a prior art search and we found some things that already exist to try to modify it, but we weren't satisfied with the solutions they developed. So we thought, hey, there's actually a, mark, uh, there's actually a problem here that does not yet have a solution. It hasn't been described in the literature or in the prior art. So let's pursue it because this doctor is telling us there's a market. So let's talk about what we wanted our device to do. So we wanted to create a guide arm uh, which would essentially allow us to introduce a plate inside the pelvis using a minimally invasive approach in surgery. The current ilioinguinal approach is a very open procedure. They essentially open the entire pelvis and expose everything in the pelvis to get to the bone. But we thought, you know, under fluoroscopy using live x-ray imaging, if we use a guide arm that introduces the plate, we can just glide along the inside of the iliac crest and find our position without opening the entire body. But if we do that, how are we gonna know where to put the screws? And do we even wanna put screws? So what we thought next was, well, why don't we use it? Why don't we attach to that plate a very rigid guide arm that's connected to the outside of the patient and has drill guides through which you can drill from outside the body through a dislocated hip and drill holes directly through where you know the plate's gonna be because it's all connected through a rigid metal guide arm. And then after that, instead of putting screws in, we can put something called uh, fiber wire. It's just essentially like a tightrope. You pass the tightrope through the hole you made in the skin, through the bone, all the way through the other side of the plate, and then have a little device on the inside that allows you to pull back on it and create tension. And then once you pull back and create tension, tie it down on the other side of the bone so that instead of screwing into bone, you're actually compressing it from both sides. You're side squeezing it together like a sandwich. And so that's what we did. 
So we can jump forward to the device. So here was our approach. We have a plate here. This plate is going to be introduced in a minimally invasive approach. You're not, of, not even going to see the plate when it's in place, except under X-ray. You have this guide arm that's designed to hold it in place and hold it rigidly along the guide arm while it's in place. And then outside of the patient, this is all outside of the patient here through the guide arm, you have these drill guides through which you can pass uh, drill drivers essentially, which allows the drill bit to travel directly in line so that you know when you drill, it goes through the bone and through the hole in the plate. Once you drill that hole, you can pass the wire through it, the fiber wire, with one of these anchors that will naturally kind of flop open once it passes through the tunnel that you've created and then just pull back on it. Uh, just pull back and tie a knot down on another piece of metal on the other side. And we created these little discs to kind of portray that. And once you do that, instead of using the bone, you're actually compressing the bone. So you're no longer dependent on the, the, the cheesy nature of the bone. In fact, you're reinforcing it. And so this was a fairly disruptive idea. And so has significant work to be done from a regulatory perspective. It's a class two device, meaning that it's not unheard of, but it's new enough that it would require us to do lots of studies to validate its safety and prove that it works in humans. So there are multiple predicate plates that are used in hip fractures. That's what makes it a class two instead of a class one. It has a 510K pathway, which is fancy terms and FDA approval process, meaning that although other things exist, it still needs some work as far as proving that it's safe. And then fortunately it had a clearly defined pathway in the FDA system for how to get these uh, plates uh, approved by the FDA because so many companies had done it in the past, including Acumed and Stryker. So what we did essentially uh, was we patented it. And I think earlier on in the presentation, I showed a picture of a patent off to the side and it happened to be the patent for this device. And now the university is in uh, conversation with multiple potential licensing companies, including Stryker and a company called uh, Starframe about how to get this device into market and how to design a trial to actually test it. But that's my last case. I think we'll wrap up because I think we're approaching two hours in and it's been a lot of fun chatting with you guys. So I wanted to invite you guys to ask any additional questions before we wrap up. Philip, that's just amazing. That's wonderful. Now with a 510k, will it have to go down to human trials? It sure does. It sure does. Any invasive device will. Right. That's just remarkable. And your advice this evening has been really quite thought provoking, including I was really quite struck, uh, struck by what you said about, you know, maybe getting into medicine first and then doing your master's afterwards. I can say to you, I mean, you know me really well, Philip, I, I would love to do a master's on a lot of different subjects. You know, but the problem is I'm just too old now. I, <clears throat> but the thing, to, to go and master a subject where you can then figure out what you need and then go master the subject, I think is terrific advice. Adidia <clears throat> has taken over the questions for us. Adidia, do you have two or three more questions for our guests this evening? Yes. I know that you have a shift at 10 p.m. tonight, so I, I'll we, try We got to get you out of here. Yeah. That's okay. We've got time. <laughs> um, so first up, um, how prominent is physician burnout among physician innovators, especially when their research is not getting results? Good that question. is an excellent question. And I think it is a problem. The reality is that I know a lot of people who've been burned out by this work. And it's something I face commonly, even when things are going well, when, especially in the pharmaceutical company, because things move so slowly. I'm constantly wondering whether we're going to actually succeed. And though I'm operating with a high suspicion that we won't, because statistically our likelihood of success is low, uh, I know that um, I'm sort of at risk for burnout in this case. Uh, it's something where we have to constantly explore why we're doing what we're doing and try to find joy, not only in the, the result, but in the process. I love meeting with engineering students. I love designing devices. I've failed on seven or eight of them. And I still think back on those devices and the things I learned in the process. And um, it, it's, it can be tough on people. I'll admit there's no, there's no way around it, but you got to find joy in what you do. 
It was said about Thomas Edison, who invented the light bulb, the actual quote from Edison himself was that he came up with 3,000 different designs before he found the one that worked. Yeah. Uh, did he? Yes, we'll do, just do one more. So what, what advice would you offer an aspiring physician scientist who wants to develop a novel device for diseases or conditions that aren't very well funded or popular? For example, women's health. Wonderful. I think that's a great question. And you're going to be heavily dependent on government funding. It's the reality. And so these, there are lots of problems that don't have significant corporate interest. And those are uh, generally more well supported by government funding. And gosh, there's funding for everything. There's funding for undifferentiated toe pain. And it is worth, it is, I'm, I'm telling you, there is money for you. If you're going to study something that you believe is going to make a difference for patients, you need only find the source. So the National Institutes of Health is, a, is an umbrella that oversees more than a hundred underlying institutions. All of my funding through the pharmaceutical company actually comes from the National Institutes of Aging. And there is a National Institute of Women's Health. And they have funding for all sorts of problems and undifferentiated sorts of pain and vaginal bleeding, for instance. And I would, I would encourage them to look there. Thank you, Philip. Uh, can you go to the next slide? I think uh, Aditya is going to run us through the uh, exam process. Is and there a slide after this one? There is. So uh, for everyone else that's still here, we have our assessment. There's a QR code here. I'm also going to put it in the chat and you'll be able to find a link to tonight's session quiz as well as session 12. Every week we'll be reopening one past session so that those of you who have not been with our program from the start will be able to earn an additional two hours of virtual shadowing. Um, so please be sure to copy down these links for your reference and please be sure to watch the YouTube recording before taking these quizzes. And I believe you've put into chat the uh, link to the previous exam so that they can watch. Is it numbered session 12? Session 12. On critical care surgery and retake that exam so they can get credit for that. Well, thank you, everybody. Philip, what a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. And I, I look forward to our next time together in the ED. Philip, typically, uh, there will, you know, we'll place this online. This will be our 88th lecture that we place online. And typically over the next couple of months, around 5,000 individuals, pre-healthcare individuals will watch your lecture. And each one of them, Philip, in their career will go on to see probably 100,000 patients. Say, you know, that's a safe estimate. Um, 5,000 times 100,000 is a half a billion. So Phil, tonight you've touched a half a billion lives, you know, um, and so we just are deeply grateful. Uh, let's ask everybody to put thank you, Dr. Jarrett, into chat so you can see uh, over 300 thank yous coming from all over the world, uh, from good old downtown Dallas all the way to Thailand and beyond. Um, and to everyone who attended tonight on behalf of the working group, we are so grateful. We'll be here next week. Next week, we're going to talk about what did we learn in this past season on the admissions committee of ways to help you prepare your application. Dr. Wynn will join me. He is one of my uh, co-admissions committee members. And we're looking forward to seeing you again. So on behalf of the whole team and on behalf of Dr. Jarrett, we want to thank you for coming tonight and we want to wish you.